Hare Krishna Mataji. Um, please accept my humble obeisances. Please accept um, my humble obeisances. Humble obeisances. So we're going to wait for um, a couple of more minutes for some people to join, and then we can start, OK? OK. Does one sing Jai Radha Madhava or not? Um, so I'm going to um, kindly, if you don't mind, introduce you and then um, and just give you offer a brief description to our audience, um, just a formal introduction, and then you can start. So. Should so, I say? I, I, I'll start now. Um, so I'll, I'll start. So Hare Krishna. Um, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Guru and Guranga. So um, I am I'm pleased and most honored to announce our, our guest speaker today for uh, this Sunday's Feast Lecture um, coordinated by ISKCON New York Brooklyn Temple. So um, I just wanna let everyone know that um, the, the entire lecture is comprised of 45 minutes. And at the end, we hold a question and answer session, which lasts for uh, 15 minutes. So just to offer um, a brief introduction, um, about Mataji. So today's guest speaker is Her Grace Rukmini Devi Dashi Mataji. So, so Rukmini Devi Dashi Mataji, Her Grace, was introduced to Krishna consciousness from childhood. Her mother's paternal grandparents were disciples of Srila Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Her Grace Rukmini Devi Dashi Mataji grew up Growing, grew up going to ISKCON Denver and then to ISKCON Los Angeles. In 1991, Srila Bhakti Pramoda Puri Goswami gave her initiation. And in 2006, Srila Bhakti Balabdirta Goswami gave her second initiation. She received her bachelor's in math from Caltech and her master's in computer science and PhD in math from UC Berkeley, specializing in specializing in game theory. Her grace Rukmini Devi Dashi Mataji began speaking about Krishna consciousness publicly in 2013. She now lives in Columbus, Ohio, where she works as a data scientist for CAS or CAS, which is a division of the American Chemical Society and also does research and consulting. Since 2005, Rukmini Devi Dashi Mataji has periodically been giving Sunday classes at ISKCON Columbus, as well as participating actively in other services um, there, including the Columbus Bhakti Yoga Outreach Group. She currently serves as one of the secretaries of SAC or SAC, also known as the Sastric Advisory Council of ISKCON. She is co-authoring a book with her grace, Urmila Devi Dashi, otherwise known as Dr. Urmila Edith Best. The book is entitled Career Dharma, The Natural Art of Work, which is set to be published in, 2000, in 2021. Her talk, No Egoism, No Lethargy, will be based on a chapter of that book. So Mantaji, you can begin. The stage is all yours. Terrible. Horrible. So since uh, we have uh, 45 minutes for the whole class, I will just say my uh, preliminary prayers and then uh, begin the talk. So, Om Jnana Kittimirandhasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshuru Milita Nyena Tasmai Shri Guru Venima Namong Vishnu Padaya Shri Gauru Priyamurte Shri Mati Bhakti Balluk Tilta Goswami Namine Namong Vishnu Padaya Gaur Prashtai Budle Shri Bhakti Pramodaya Puri Goswami Namine Namong Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtai Budle Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauru Vani Pachayane Nirvishesha Shri Vadi Paschapta Deshataya Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adyaita Gadadha Shri Vasudev Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Anchakopatrubhasya Trupasindubhe Bachapaditanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Pranamam Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for inviting me to speak As always it is the person who speaks who learns the most from speaking so I'll be speaking about no egoism, no lethargy, and my hope is by 
sharing what we've heard from our acharyas that one day maybe I too can escape from egoism and lethargy. So let me share my talk. Okay, are you seeing two slides or one slide? Two slides. Ah. Yes. Uh, all right, so let me see if I can do that differently. Before you do share, sh uh, click on show portion of screen. Oh, okay. And then it'll give you a box and you, uh, then when you go to the share, arrange that box over the big slide that's on the left. Is it, is it one slide now? Yes, it's perfect, terrible. Horrible. Thank you. All right. So we'll, I'll be talking about no egoism, no lethargy. And this is based on our upcoming book with uh, Romila Prabhu, who has kindly joined us. Uh, our book is called Career Dharma, The Natural Art of Work. And I'll give you a very brief overview. So it has, we, we have a preface and then we have three parts. Part one is one's na natural work. Part two is the art of work for individuals. And part three is the art of work for systems. And the chapter is in part two. However, it, it draws on things from part one. So I'll very briefly be covering some stuff from part one. Here are the contents of part one and specifically the, the parts that I'll be briefly going through from part one are what is my nature, six kinds of wealth, uh, what is my nature, qualities, and a little bit about the shades of ego. Then part two has many chapters and I'll very briefly be touching on this portion which is the first couple of chapters of part two, honest work of value and going deeper into esoteric understandings of meaningful work uh, before coming to the main substance of the talk, which is no egoism, no lethargy. How can we work without egoism and lethargy? And here briefly is part three, but we won't be going through part three. So first, the six kinds of wealth. So we may know that the definition of Bhagavan or the Supreme Lord is the one who has six kinds of wealth in full. He's the owner of all of the knowledge and wisdom, the owner of all the strength, power, and health. So these, these types of wealth, they each actually have Sanskrit names, which are listed on the left here. And they're, so they're often translated in, by single terms. However, they each have a slightly different connotation. So the six kinds of wealth are Aishwarya, which is organizational leadership, money, luxury, gyan, which is knowledge and wisdom, virya, which is strength, power, and health, shri, which is splendid beauty, gracefulness, and also a charismatic kind of leadership, yash, which is meritorious fame and community, and vairagya, which is equanimity and freedom. So each of us also has a little bit of some of these kinds of wealth, not infinitely like the Supreme Lord, but a tiny bit. And each of us also likes some of these types of wealth more than others. Each of us, so of course we would all like all of these things if we could have them. However, for some of us, 
knowledge is very important and beauty is not so much. And for some of us, fame is very important and health is, you know, we could do without it. So for each of us, we have a profile as to how much we like which of these kinds of wealth. So that's one part of our nature. And I'll say, since we're, we will be talking about Arjuna, the, the protagonist of the Bhagavad Gita, so I'll say a little bit more about Yash, which is one of Arjuna's favorite kinds of wealth, that's meritorious fame and community. So what does the adjective meritorious mean? So there are people who are famous basically just for being famous. So they may be well known, they may actually have some merit, but that's not what they're famous for. So for instance, as far as I know, I could be mistaken, Paris Hilton became famous essentially for being famous. And she actually has a lot of acumen as a businesswoman, but that's not what she's famous for. She's famous for just being a celebrity. So that is called kirti. Kirti just means that people are talking about you. And it doesn't say why are people talking about you. They could be talking about you for any reason or for no particularly good reason at all. However, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that kirti and dharma are two personalities. Kirti is the wife of dharma. Dharma is, is righteousness. It is uh, order, the, the, the natural order. So when these two are married, then their offspring is Yash. So Yash is, is translated as fame. However, it's a particular type of fame. It is the fame that comes from righteousness. So this is righteous or meritorious fame. And this is something that Arjuna was very accustomed to as being the warrior who had done glorious deeds and was therefore famous for his for his righteous righteousness and his honor. So these these are these six six qualities, and all of them are ultimately owned by the Supreme Lord Shri Krishna. So we can each think about what which of these do we like, which of these is our favorite. And so part of being a hero is also uh, organizing one's community. So when one organizes one's community, then one is becomes famous throughout the community for one's good deeds for all of society. And so that's that's a particular that was particularly liked by Arjuna. He wanted to be a leader, and a leader does does these righteous deeds and helps helps out people. So this is, this is heroism that leads to righteous fame. And we also have different driving values. What would we like to have, what would we, we, we like to have around us? What would we like the world to be like? So we each like the world to have all of these values. We want things to be just or fair. We want things to be conducted honorably. We want there to be beauty around us. We want a supportive community. We want, we want to have the truth accessible to us. We want things to be done wisely. And we want things to be done in a sustainable way and in such a way that uh, they can lead to prosperity. That's, that's what regenerative ultimately means. We each would like all of these things around us. However, instinctively, we may find if we examine ourselves that we would tend to actually think of one of these things or one pair of these things more than the others. That this, this always comes up instinctively without having to think about it, without anyone raising a question about it. This is what we think of from morning till night when we're you know, talking with our friends, not necessarily because somebody has tasked us with trying to make these things happen, but because this is this is real a value that is really dear to our heart, and that we we feel is is really paramount. So that's another thing that we might think of: which of these which of these sets of values is most dear to us? 
And in order for there to be all of these values in society, it's actually best that each of these values is taken care of by different people because sometimes they're in tension with one another. Sometimes uh, one, thing, one thing may be in, in contrast with an, another in a different situation. And the way that tension is resolved is if different people are each advocating the different values, then the balance among the different people in the population leads to all of those values occurring in, in a balanced way throughout society. So that's another thing we can think of in terms of what is, what is our nature. So Arjuna, as we said, he really wanted to be a hero and he was a hero up until the very point when he was about to embark on the Mahabharata war. And here we see that he, this may be familiar to us, this is the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, that he's come to a, a paradoxical situation where he has two choices of action and in neither case does he know how to be a hero. So he's come to the battlefield and so he is supposed to fight. That is how he will be righteous, but then he's supposed to kill his, his dear teachers, his great grandfather, his cousins, and that doesn't sound righteous. And he feels that this is not being heroic. This is this is will lead to destruction. So then he doesn't know what to do. How how can he? The different notions of dharma, the dharma of of one's fa protecting one's family and of respecting one's elders versus the dharma of fighting the righteous war. These these notions of dharma are conflicting for him. So then he no longer knows how to have this righteous fame. So we'll leave him there for the moment and we'll come to another issue, which is linked to his, his dilemma, which is the false ego. So one of the things we mentioned was the shades of ego. There is a central illusion, which is what leads us to identify with our body and mind and whatever we consider to be mine and especially me, I consider that I am the center of reality. So this is what we see in the universe. There's, I'm the center of the universe. Everything revolves around me. There's my stuff. There's stuff that relates to me. Um, there's stuff that I don't like. And then there's everything else, which is not really very important because it doesn't have to do with me. And anything that I can't is outside of my field of vision is basically nowhere. That's, that's my whole universe. So that's, that's the false ego, that's the central illusion. And that leads me uh, in particular to these, these different shades of ego. So the dark shade of ego, this, this is an illusion, this is not reality. And so this dark shade of ego keeps me from seeing reality at all. If I am completely self-centered, then I can't see uh, the reality outside myself, just as I can't see when this this blind this window is covered by a blind. The medium shade of ego. My vision is a bit occluded, and so I can have some idea of reality. However, I'm still self-centered, so that still holds me back from seeing reality uh, completely. And with the light shade of ego. Now the, the shades are drawn, I can see outside, I'm still seeing through a window, but I can at, at least see clearly uh, reality. And that is still not the same as being actually outside. So that would be transcending the shades of ego and being completely outside of that illusion that I'm the center of the universe. That would be understanding truly that it's Sri Krishna, the Supreme Lord, who is, who is the center. So now we know these names of these ego shades. So sattva is the light shade of ego. So it leads us to goodness, clarity, serenity, uh, light. Rajas is the medium shade of ego. So it leads us to intense activity, passion, and it's associated with redness and anything intense, intense flavors. 
Uh, and tamas is ignorance, inertia, dullness, and darkness. So these are the shades of ego. These, this leads to inactivity and lethargy. So these we would like to get out of. Now, what happens when we work in these shades of ego is that the work that we perform is karma. And karma is subject to the law of action and reaction. So here, if, if one shoots a rifle and one hasn't braced oneself, then, then it'll kick back and it'll, so the, the, the force of the bullet going that way um, is balanced by an equal and opposite reaction. It'll, it'll push us the other way. So similarly, when we try to do any action and we're in this self-centered illusion, the shades of ego, then our action, which we think is, is acting on the external reality, it's, it's actually, we're just actually acting on ourselves, perhaps at a later time. So that action just comes back to us as a reaction. That is karma. And so since the reaction always comes to balance the action, then the balance is always restored. And net net, we come to zero. So we think that we're doing lots of things. However, any positive action that we have, a credit is always balanced by uh, a, a debit. So if somebody, if somebody does something to me and I suffer and I tolerate it, then that's my credit and then uh, later I enjoy. Conversely, uh, if I do something good, then uh, later I enjoy, and then that, that pious credit is then debited, and then I'm back to zero. So if you're familiar with double entry bookkeeping, you have the idea that every debit has to be balanced with an equal and opposite credit. Now in, in bookkeeping, the reason that this is interesting is because you have accounts in, in the ledger that are not just about you. So there's, for instance, accounts receivable, accounts payable, there's somebody else involved, but when it's just me and I'm just moving things between my different accounts, then actually nothing changes. Everything is zero. And so similarly, when we're working in the shades of ego and we're in this self-centered illusion, then we can't ever actually increase the value. Uh, eventually, everything comes back to zero. It's, it's, just, it's just net zero and we're not actually getting anywhere. So we may feel like we're, we're acting and we're accumulating riches, but inside we will feel empty because we haven't actually done anything and we haven't actually gotten anything. We're just acting in the, in the shades of ego, which is really just an illusion. So we might be like a video game player. So video game player is, comes, is absorbed in some video game and thinks that the video game player player is in in this imaginary world and it, it looks like uh, so suppose i'm the player I'm, I'm accumulating riches i'm accumulating gold i'm accumulating books i'm accumulating potions all kinds of things and i'm doing all kinds of things and it may appear that i'm being very active but actually all of all that's actually happening is, is a bunch of electrons are, are uh, moving around and different logic gates are switching on and off within the computer, all these ones and zeros. And then they're making various pixels light up. So all this is very different than, than what is happening inside my mind. My mind is in an illusion that I'm at the center. And I'm in the illusion that I'm doing a lot of things, but actually I'm very constrained that basically the the programmer has set up the game and has made it appear that I'm doing so many things, but actually not so many things are actually happening. And so, so when we're playing a video game, then this is apparent. And actually, when we're acting in the world, this is also the case. So uh, Sri Krishna is, says in Bhagavad Gita chapter 13, verse 30, that that the the no the one who truly knows knows that one does not is not actually doing anything, 
And Srila Prabhupada says in the purport that practically speaking, the body is a machine designed by the Supreme Lord to fulfill desires. So we're writing inside of our, our body and we're thinking that we're doing so many things and we're identifying that I'm, I'm this body and I'm, doing, I'm controlling this body and I'm doing all this stuff. But actually, this machine is being controlled by the modes of nature, the shades of ego. So we come to the, the main topic, how do we transcend these shades of ego? So this is a verse from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verse 30. And I'll go through the Sanskrit because we'll go through these six parts of this verse. So the verse is, Mai sarvani karmani sanyasya dhyatma chetasa nirashir nirmamo bhutva yutyasva vigata jvara So these six parts are Mai sarvani karmani and to me all sorts of activities sanyasya giving up completely adhyatma chetasa with full knowledge of the self-consciousness Uh, nirashir nirmama, without desire for profit, without ownership, uh, bhutva, being. And then yutyaswa, fight, vigatachvara, without being le lethargic. So we can see then in this translation that Sri Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, therefore, O Arjuna, surrendering all your works unto me, with mind intent on me, and without desire for gain, and free from egoism and lethargy, fight. So this is how we get free from egoism and lethargy. So let's go through this. There's six factors, and let's go through these one by one. So we're restating these six factors. So the first one, mai sarvani karmani, is that we dedicate our work to the ultimate source. The second factor, Sanyasya, let go of desires to enjoy the six varieties of riches on the transactional plane. The transactional plane is the one with the debits and credits that I just described. Adhyatma uh, chetasa, fill our consciousness with awareness of our spiritual self. Nirashir nirmamo bhutva, let go of the ego of ownership. Yudhyaswa, act externally according to our nature. So in here, Krishna just said, fight, yudhyaswa. And that's because he's speaking to Arjuna. And uh, in, our, in our plan, in our procedure, we'll be talking about all of our natures, which may or may not be to fight. So we've translated this as act externally according to our nature. And finally, vigata jwara, let go of lethargy born of fever. And Srila Prabhupada has translated that it's actually both egoism and lethargy that we're letting go of. So let's go through these uh, six factors one by one. The first one is dedicate our work to the ultimate source. And that ultimate source is the Lord. So here we see someone who is uh, bathing in a holy river and dedicating herself. So when we connect to the source, then we can get out of that dilemma of everything ending up being zero, that everything, every credit is balanced by a debit. Because when we correct, connect with the source, then we're connecting with the infinite who is ever expanding, Shri Krishna, growing more and more. And so when we're connected with something growing more and more, and then we align, and we are also dedicating ourselves, then we're part of something that's growing more and more, and we can contribute more and more. So that's how we get, that is the path of bhakti. We get out of karma and we're doing devotional service. Then the next thing, so three of these I had mentioned, the ones in green, these are positive, and the ones in blue, they are negative. So they, they go together. So once we do the, the positive thing, then it's easy to do the negative thing. So once we dedicate our work to the ultimate source, Sri Krishna, then it's easy to do the to let go of desires to enjoy the six varieties of riches because we know that they all belong to Krishna. So when we're letting go of the desires to enjoy, then we're offering up whatever we have or whatever we receive 
to the Supreme Lord. We are understanding that whatever we, whatever comes into our custody or our stewardship, we're just custodians. We're not the enjoyers. And so we use that in service or we give, give it to others to distribute for service. Uh, so it's easy to let go when we ourselves are dedicated. So we talked earlier about this, one of the six kinds of riches being yash or righteous fame. So at the beginning of the Mahabharata war, Arjuna did not know how to be a hero when he was trying to be a hero in the way he had been all his life. Uh, so basically in his own right. And so the way to remain righteous was not to be a hero in his own right, but to be a hero for Krishna, to be completely dedicated. So then he could let go of this, this qualm about how, how it is actually dishonorable to destroy the dynasty and to kill one's elders and so forth. And he was able to continue with his, his role of heroism in terms of strength and power, and that, that he was able to continue uh, exerting uh, during the subsequent the Mahabharata War. Then the next positive thing is to fill our consciousness with awareness of our spiritual self. Uh, so when we know our true identity, Adhyatma Chetasa, then Sri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that we can relish and rejoice in the self. Oops. Seven o'clock. So Sri Krishna says, This perfection is characterized by one's ability to see the self by the pure mind and to relish and rejoice in the self. In that joyous state, one is situated in boundless transcendental happiness, realized through transcendental senses. Established thus, one never departs from the truth, and upon gaining this, he thinks there is no greater gain. So the solution to the false ego is to have our true ego. We understand our true identity. So our true identity, as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, our, our Acharya or teacher says, Jibar Shorupoy Krishna Nittodash, our true identity as, as the eternal servant of Krishna. And the more we understand what that identity is, then the more we can experience transcendental happiness. And then that's, that central illusion is dispelled, and we are in the reality outside. So for each of us, that, that is different, because each of us has a unique service, a unique role to play. And Shri Krishna has created us each in different varieties. We can serve him in different rasas. We can serve him as a servant or as a friend, like Arjuna was his friend. We can even become his parents, like Jashoda and Nanda, or we could serve him as his consorts, like Srimati Radharani. So we wouldn't, uh, we can serve the, uh, serve him in, in consorthood or whichever s service we like. And if we're not very familiar with the uh, what our particular rasa is, we can at least know that we are completely dedicated to him and offer ourselves to him. So that will bring us to the beginning of this stage of relishing and rejoicing in the self. And this also helps us to be detached from the results, because the results actually don't belong to us anyway. They belong to the Lord. So once we understand that we are the spiritual self and we actually have nothing to do with this material world, then we can, that makes it easy for us to let go of the ego of ownership. Nirashir Nirmamubhutva. So we give up everything and we give it in love. Whatever comes to us, we give in love and we don't 
even expect anything for ourselves, we give it in love to the Supreme Lord. So Arjuna was thinking about whether he had to fight this battle or not. And then, as we know in chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita, he asks Krishna to show him his universal form. So Krishna does that. And Krishna shows Arjuna that it is I actually who have already destroyed all of these warriors before you. I'm the actual doer. And he sees, Arjuna sees that all of these warriors are, are being devoured by Sri Krishna. So he gives up this idea that he's the hero, he's just the instrument. And it's actually Sri Krishna who is the, who has the full fame. So a little bit earlier in Bhagavad Gita, in uh, verse 27 of the third chapter, Sri Krishna says that, tells Arjun that the spirit soul, bewildered by the influence of false ego, thinks himself the doer of activities that are in actuality carried out by the three modes of material nature. On the other hand, in, in chapter 18, he explains more fully what are the actual act factors of action. There's five factors of action, the place of action, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul. These are the five factors of action. So one can let go of this idea that I'm the hero if one understands that actually it is everything is up to Krishna. And so Arjuna, as we know, did eventually fight the battle of Kurukshetra and did appear to be doing many actions. However, much later in the Mahabharata, after Krishna's departure in the uh, Moshal Parva, chapter 16, or I think it's book 16, uh, chapter 7, Krishna had departed from the world and then Arjuna went to Dwarka and was trying to escort the queens of Krishna back to Hastinapur so that they could be under the protection of the royal court there. However, he tried to string his bow, Gandiva, and it was very, very difficult, un uncharacteristically difficult, when the, uh, the convoy was beset by robbers. So while he was trying to string the bow, the robbers were just wrecking havoc everywhere. Then he tried to call to mind his celestial weapons, and none of them would come. And then he had an inexhaustible quiver of arrows. So he was shooting as well as he could with just the normal arrows that were not the celestial weapons. And then the quiver was exhausted. So, and then ultimately uh, various of the queens were kidnapped by the robbers. And when he came to see Sage Vasudev, he, he lamented that he had been this hero all his life and then what suddenly happened? These were just plain ordinary robbers. They weren't even great, great fighters. And Vasudev said that the time for his heroism was over and it was time for him to wind up his, his life. So the doer, even, even in the time that, that Arjuna appeared to be doing everything, actually everything was being done by Krishna's sanction. And as soon as Krishna withdrew his sanction, then no, none of these other four factors, uh, his, his, act, his being in, a, in, a, in his body, his, his own will, his, his arms, his mighty arms, and his effort, none of those uh, could, could be fulfilled once, once Krishna had withdrawn his sanction. So nevertheless, we do act externally according to our nature. Yudhyaswa, uh, Krishna told Arjuna. So even though Krishna had shown his universal form, he still asked Arjuna to fight. And so here's a great quote by Srila Prabhupada that I really love. Srila Prabhupada gave a lecture in Los Angeles in 1973, and he said, Krishna never advised Arjuna that you sit down. I am your friend. I shall do everything. You sit down and smoke ganja. Krishna never said that. Krishna was doing everything. Still, he was to fight. He was inducing. You must fight. Neither Arjuna said, 
Krishna, you are so my friend, great friend. Better you do it. I sit down, let me smoke ganja. No, Arjuna also did not say. This is not Krishna consciousness that, God, you please do everything for me and let me smoke ganja. This is not God consciousness. God consciousness means you must work, work for God. That is God consciousness. That is Krishna consciousness. So, despite our not being the doers, still we must act, and one way or another we will act. So at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna had told uh, Krishna that I shall not fight, and he dropped his bow. And towards the end, in uh, chapter 18, verse 60, Krishna says, under illusion you are now declining to act according to my direction, but compelled by the work born of your own nature, you will act all the same, O son of Kunti. So one way or another, we will act according to the nature of our body-mind, our, our psychophysical complex. So we must act and we will act, so we should act externally according to our nature. And in this case, Arjuna should fight. And Sri Krishna considered it so important to align with our nature that he said almost the identical verse twice, once a few verses after our verse 30, so this is in chapter 3, verse 35, and once again in the final chapter, chapter 18, in verse 47. And so I won't read all the verses, but he did say very, that it's very important to discharge one's prescribed duties and not another's, engage in one's own occupation and not another's. We have to align with our own nature. He, he considered this very, very important. And so this is even, even as we're trying to transcend, we're trying to transcend the shades of ego, that does not mean that we're trying to transcend our, our nature. Ultimately, we may transcend our nature, but first we, we have to align with our nature. Uh, we transcend our nature by, by relishing and rejoicing our spiritual self, but while we're acting in this world, we align with our, the nature of a, the psychophysical complex that we have here. And finally, the sixth factor is to let go of lethargy born of fever, and this is both egoism and lethargy. So getting back to the shades of ego, egoism here refers to rajas, the shade of ego involved with passion, intensity, and activity, and lethargy uh, is associated with tamas, which is the shade of ego associated with darkness, inertia. And both of these can be associated with fever. So we can have feverish activity we can be frenzied. We can, you, uh, if someone is is in a fever, they can then they can suddenly be possessed by some idea, and then think that something has to be done right now and start uh, madly acting all over the place. That's feverish activity. That is beyond uh, beyond balance, and then that is followed by lethargy. Uh, and then you know suddenly you know that didn't work, and you know one feels like doing nothing. And it's said in the Bhagavad Gita that these shades of ego, they follow one after another and they're always vying for supremacy. So each of them follows one after another. And even the material sattva, the, the material mode of goodness, it's always contaminated by a little bit of rajas and tamas. So the central thing is is this central illusion. As long as we have any of this central central illusion, we will be contaminated by Rajas and Thomas. So the real thing is to purify ourselves of all these and let go of lethargy. And as I had said, that when we act according to our external nature, then that helps us to act in balance because the nature of sattva is balance. And so when we're aligned, with our nature, then that helps us to uh, make these these shades be gone. So our 45 minutes are up. Thank you for your attention. So I pray that by the blessings and association of all you Vaishnavas to help me also to get rid of the 
get rid of egoism and lethargy and dedicate myself completely in devotional service. And I will now take any questions. I think Hare Krishna Mataji, thank you for your beautiful discourse and your wonderful association. So if anybody has any questions, we can take them now. Hare Krishna Mataji. Um, you, you mentioned um, the five factors of action verse. Um, do you remember the verse number? It's 18.14, uh, 18. and I can go back to that slide. Yeah, in that verse, I think there are a couple of the factors that have always kind of been fuzzy for me. Um, yeah, it says, yeah, can you distinguish between, um, so you see, my, my thing is that, you know, the place of action in the body, you know, sounds very much like the senses because that's where the senses, you know, the body is basically you know, comprised of the senses. Um, and then the, I guess the endeavor, you know, I mean, that's the effort put out by the senses, right? Right. So uh, another way of looking at it is, so the performer is is our will. So this is this is the person who 